So back to Rome, you have Vespasian, who was this, the, the, the only reputably decent man to become Roman emperor. He's on his way to Rome to restore order with his armies. Um, him and his son, Titus, met up in Caesarea. And then Vespasian went to Rome and Titus went to Israel and went to Jerusalem to restart the siege. And this is right at the point of the Passover. And we have um, probably three times the normal population there because people are coming for the annual feast. So they're coming from all over Israel to come to the temple to perform their sacrifices, to give their offerings. And they're coming with their families. And that 2.7 million number doesn't include any women. Uh, who were ritually unclean, so they weren't counted, and children weren't counted. So we likely have a lot more than 2.7 million people. Um, <clears throat> you know, and so if we start the idea of the siege, because Titus wasn't there for a whole three and a half years. But if we begin the, the, the idea with um, the first surrounding and then for a brief period, they left and then came back. We have a, a, a three and a half year period, which is also in scripture predicted um, by the prophet Daniel. Um, and in Daniel 12, 5, 7, Daniel says, then I looked. Then I, Daniel, looked and beheld two others stood, one on this bank of the stream and one on that bank of the stream. And someone said to the man clothed in linen, who was above the waters of the stream, how long shall it be until the end of these wonders? <clears throat> and I heard the man clothed in linen, who was above the waters of the stream. And he raised his right hand and his left hand toward heaven and swore by him who lives forever that it would be for a time times and half a time and that when the shattering of the power of the holy people comes to an end these things would all be finished and two things to note there is time times and half a time is how the ancients would have said three and a half years so time would have been one it's singular times would have been two as a plural and then half a time would be half of the one. So it was three and a half years. And the other thing to note is that when the shattering of the power of the holy people comes to an end, all these things would be finished. And Daniel is told to seal up the words of these, this prophecy because they are for a time yet in the distant future. Now, when John in the book of Revelation makes his prophecy, God tells him or the angel tells him, do not seal the words up. Do not seal the words of this prophecy for these are soon to be right. It's like so here it is. And John uses a lot of language that is from the book of Daniel. I think um, Michael Heiser goes over this in his book on Revelation. Um, so if anyone's interested in learning more about the Old Testament revelation or references in Revelation, that's his book on Revelation is 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 the one to get. Um, hey, Matthew, uh, yes, I just want to I just want to interrupt quickly. So this is a wonderful introduction when it comes to the historical context of what was happening just before the siege came. So there was like a lot of political turmoil, bo both. Uh, in Rome and in Jerusalem, we can see everyone fighting against each other. There's like chaos on both sides. And now uh, the siege is about to happen. And from what I understand at that time, uh, because the siege came, uh, Romans were occupying surrounding Jerusalem. There was so shortage of food. Uh, people were starving to death. And I even heard uh, that uh, people were turning towards each other to to basically they were practicing cannibalism, which reminded me of Second Kings uh, chapter six when mothers had to boil and eat uh, each other's uh, children. Like a mother would come to her neighbor or her friend, and then 
she would kill and eat maybe their kid. And then the mother of that kid would come and eat her. Uh, so can we please uh, come to this period of uh, when the siege comes and, uh, and people sure. are starving, they're fighting each other, how this monstrosity, was, which is part of the title for today, how this sure. monstrosity within happens uh, between the Jews? Sure. So um, people were starving before the Romans had built their fence, but because there were underground tunnels, the, uh, the zealots and the other factions were able to get in and out of the city underground. They would go under the wall, sneak away, grab some food, bring it back. Um, what they were also doing was going to all the well-to-do people, the reputable people of the city, and they would bring them before everybody in the temple. So at this point, they had taken the temple. No more sacrifices were being made at this time during the siege uh, because they were using the temple as a fortress um, to wage war from. So they were sleeping in there. They were eating in there. They had already eaten all of the provisions that were stored up in the temple. Um, so all the things that had been offered in sacrifice, all the grain, all the wheat, the corn, the fruits, the nuts, the, the dates, all of those things had been devoured already. There's no more food. So they would accuse the rich and wealthy of uh, being those who were about to desert. You know, they were they were going to be traitors. And they were going to run to the Romans. And to make it look like their killing was somehow justifiable. But really what they were doing was killing them so they could take their valuables and their food and they could use the valuables to purchase food um, from those who may have had enough. Um, but eventually that ran out too. And what they were doing was going house to house and they were literally taking the food out of people's mouths. Like if people, so they'd come in and the people knew what they were there for by this point, you know, the rumors had spread, everybody's going, oh, here they come, they're coming to take our food. And people would immediately put food in their mouth to eat and swallow so that they couldn't, you know, so they could have something in their belly before they took everything. And they would literally take it out. They would make them vomit. And they were so hungry and desperate, they would take the vomited food. They would hold babies upside down that had food in their mouths and, and shake the baby to get the food to drop out of its mouth because it would start crying and then open its mouth and the food would come out. Um, they were very commonly, they were getting most of their protein and sustenance from drinking blood. They were drinking the blood of the people they killed. Um, there, to my recollection, are no accounts of cannibalism from the zealots themselves. That does, but they, other than drinking the blood, which technically is cannibalism. I mean, you're surviving on their blood, but I wouldn't doubt that they had eventually because most of the people there had what's called belly bloat from starvation. Um, you know, if you've seen any, any pictures of uh, people who are hungry and haven't eaten in a very long time, their bellies become distended. Um, it's because when you're starving, the stomach itself shrinks, but the um, the the other parts of your digestive system bloat, and so your belly looks like it's grown bigger, but it's just empty air, basically. Um, so people were at this point of starvation, which is a sign you're on your way to death. Mothers are recorded as eating their children here. Um, and people who would doubt this account from Josephus or even the biblical account that you brought up from um, Second Kings, um, we have modern day references of this in the 90s in North Korea. The people were starving to death and we have these stories from people who have escaped and from Christians there who got out over the border into China. And what they would do is one mother 
or one family would take their infant and give it to another family and that family would give them theirs so that at least they knew they weren't eating their own child, right? Um, and that's what they would do. They would boil them. Um, and those people were so hungry, they were literally eating tree bark, dirt, uh, anything they could put in their mouth and put into their belly, they were eating. Um, and to this day, when they see people who they think are Americans or are Americans, and I'm just talking about rural villagers, they because the government blamed America over there, um, they will automatically become angry and uh, want vengeance because that's how badly they suffer. And they believe that what the government had told them. Um, so we, we have modern day and other examples of this throughout history. Um, people can't imagine it, but when you're, when you're starving and when you've seen so much death and destruction, your body is, you're in shock. You're dealing with trauma. You're not thinking rationally anymore and your body just wants to survive. So your hunger overrides what you normally wouldn't do and what you normally know would be wrong um, because you know either do that or I'm going to die.